And I know that if we stay the course, if we continue to try to repeat the old models, it'll be a very ugly world. But we have the opportunity to create something new, something never done before. And I think you here in Iceland are truly on that cutting edge. And, and Andre's book uh, clearly presents this. And from the gentleman we're going to be hearing from later, I, I know this is going to come up more and more. You, you like, the, like the people in Latin America, uh, you have incredible resources here. There's the old fishing industry, of course, and there's energy. Energy and water, scarce resources on this planet today. And intelligence, human beings, creative human beings. And this is a time when I think people around the planet are, are understanding that we all have to protect our own resources. Iceland must protect its resources, and like Latin America, your resources must go to benefit your people, not just foreign corporations. At the same time, the recognition that we're all one on this planet. We are one community, and we must serve each other and work together to create a safe, sustainable, just, and peaceful world. Now, how do we get to where we are today? Um, you know, I, I know I have to take a uh, a lot of the, some of the responsibility for that, because we really created the world's first global empire, the first empire that's been created without the military primarily. It was done by economic hitmen like me. And we work many different ways, but perhaps the most common is that we identify another country, usually a third world country, um, that has resources that our corporations covet, like oil, or in your case, cheap energy. You know, the, I think you may be the first developed country, ranked number three in income per capita back in 2007. I think you may be the first developed country to really be hit by the hitmen. We made a point of going out to the third world. And anyway, we identify countries with resources that corporations covet. We arrange huge loans to those countries but through the World Bank or other banking affiliation. But the money doesn't actually go to the country. Instead, it goes to our own corporations to build big infrastructure projects in those countries. Bechtel, hydroelectric plants, Alcoa, various other organizations like this. This is typical. And so the money doesn't actually really go to the country. It goes back to us. But the country is left holding a huge debt. And for the most part, most of the people in that country don't benefit uh, from these projects. In places like Ecuador and Colombia and Indonesia and Congo, they're too poor to buy electricity. Or they don't have the skills to get jobs in industrial parks. But they, the citizens, are left holding this huge debt. It's such a big debt that they can't repay it. So at some point, we economic hitmen go back and say, you can't pay your debts? Give us a pound of flesh. Sell your oil real cheap to our oil companies. Sell your energy real cheap. Sell your electricity real cheap to our aluminum companies. And vote with us on the next United Nations vote. Send troops in support of ours to some place in the world like Iran. Uh, excuse me, like Iraq. Hopefully Iran won't be next. <laughs> um, and uh, in this way, we really created this global empire. In the few cases where we economic hitmen don't succeed. And I talk in my books about how I failed with Jaime Roldos, the president of Ecuador, and Omar Torrijos of Panama. I was not able to corrupt those leaders. I was not able to bring them around to get them to accept these onerous loans. In those cases, the jackals go in. These are people who overthrow governments or assassinate them. And because I wasn't able to bring Jaime Roldos of Ecuador around and Omar Torrijos of Panama, they were both assassinated by CIA-sponsored jackals. In the few cases where the jackals also fail, like Iraq, then and only then do we send in the military. This is a very insidious process, you know. And throughout history, empires have been created by armies going out and conquering other lands, and everybody knew you were, we were doing it. And everybody was proud. We were saving the world for Christianity or civilization. Or, whatever the hell we are saving it for, some great cause that we believed in, or thought we believed in. But everybody knew we were doing it. But this empire has been created clandestinely. Most people in the United States, for example, have no idea that we're benefiting off the exploitation 
of other people and their resources all over the world. They don't know this, which I think is a huge threat to democracy. And I think a democracy is built on the premise that you have an informed electorate. And the electorate of a country like the United States doesn't know about this most basic part of its foreign policy and how can we vote intelligently. If we can't vote intelligently, are we voting democratically? I think it's an important question. It's one of the reasons I write the books I write, so that I, my own people will understand what's, what's going on in this situation. But so we've created this empire, but it's not an empire like any other. It's not an empire anymore that's really run by a country. It used to be sort of a U.S. empire, but today it's really a corporate empire. The big corporations are in control. In fact, you might say, if you looked at the world 10 years ago, you saw 180 some odd countries of which a few had a lot of power. United States at times, the Soviet Union at times, the British Empire at times. But today, you might better envision this, the geopolitics as these huge clouds swirling around the planet. They know no borders. They don't answer to any specific set of laws. These are the big corporations. And they will form partnerships and deals with the Chinese, with the Taiwanese, with the Tibetans, with the Israelis and the Arab nations. With whoever has the resources, they cut it. They don't care about politics. They are running this situation. What I call the corporatocracy, the people who run these big corporations are really in control. This is not a conspiracy theory. These people don't have to get together secretly to plan things out, to plot things. They don't have to do that. But they all operate under one goal. One single goal drives every one of them. And that goal is to maximize profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. Regardless of the social and environmental costs. But we're at this time in history then that's very much like when the city-states became nations. Except now the nations are losing their importance. It's the big corporations that are out there calling the shots. Nobody gets elected in the United States or most other democracies. I'm not sure about this one, but nobody gets elected in my country without a lot of money. And all that money, most of that money, comes from the corporations one way or another. Corporations control the mainstream media, uh, either through direct ownership or advertising. They're very much in power. And I think that's the good news. Because this empire was not created by the military. It was created by us. And it's dependent on us. These corporations are totally dependent on us to buy their goods and services. The marketplace is essentially democratic if we choose to make it such. If none of you ever again buys anything made in a sweatshop, and you let the companies that use sweatshops like Nike know by email that you're not buying from them because they have sweatshops, and you send emails to Patagonia or wherever you buy from that doesn't have sweatshops and let them know that's why you're buying from them. I guarantee you, Nike will either have to stop using sweatshops or convert the sweatshops into legitimate factories where the people get honest days wages and health care, or Nike will go out of business. I guarantee it. And we've seen it happen. We, 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 we changed apartheid in South Africa. In the United States, we get the companies to clean up polluted rivers and, and open their doors wider to women and other mi and, uh, and minorities. We get them to take trans fats out of food. We've created tremendous amounts of change, we the consumer, because in fact, we're the ones who've sent the message to the corporations that we want cheap sweaters. And if these sweaters are made in sweatshops, we'll just look the other way. And we want cheap petroleum. And if that petroleum comes at the cost of destroying rainforests, we'll just look the other way. We've sent this message out. And we've also said, oh yes, and by the way, we want very high rates of return on our stock. That's the message. And so it's now time for us to turn that message around and say what we want is a sustainable, just and peaceful world for ourselves and my grandson. Thank you.